So let's look at some of the 3D anatomy here um, with a few of these videos like we did last week. And I hope you guys find this helpful. Um, I think it's a really good way to put everything together um, and talk about the relationship of structures to each other. So we want to start off with this, and here we can see the skull, we can see the upper gingiva, or the upper teeth, the lower teeth, um, the maxilla, the mandible, um, some of the other skull structures which we should know. We can see the tongue coming through here as we strip away some of the bone. Um, and although we aren't seeing the salivary glands, I kind of want to point out where they are. Um, so the lateral aspect of the oral cavity, kind of in front of the ear. Um, is where we will find the uh, parotid gland, the parotid duct, and then inferior to the mandible, we'll find the submandibular glands, and then inferior and anterior, we'll find the sublingual glands. We can see the tongue muscle here, uh, most of it being made of the genioglossus, and then the very small geniohyoid inferiorly. We can see a few of the other structures we've spoken about. So the division between the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and then the hypopharynx, which is the opening into the larynx, the cricoid cartilage, I'm sorry, the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, um, and the trachea anteriorly, and the esophagus posteriorly. If we strip all that away, and I kind of want to go back here just a bit so we can get a better look, a better appreciation of the tongue muscles. So this is the genioglossus and the geniohyoid. So as we strip those muscles away, we can see some of the other uh, laryngeal muscles, which we did not speak about, but we can see a part of, well, actually not in this view. The esophagus again, the trachea, This is the posterior aspect, which we didn't speak about much. We can see parts of the, the uh, epiglottis here is what I want to point out. So the epiglottis, which is the flap that will cover the inlet, um, and this is the top of the epiglottis. So these are the muscles, the series of muscles that I mentioned that were attached to the hyoid bone. This is the hyoid bone. Um, attached to the thyroid and cricoid cartilage and help to move the laryngeal muscles and help to move the folds, which can change the pitch of our voice, the volume of our voice, and so on. And we are going to look at the muscles individually, but these are the muscles that I was referencing. So here's a nice anterior view of all those structures again. Um, the thyroid cartilage has been removed, but the cricoid cartilage is here. Um, the actual opening into the larynx and in the hyoid bone. And then um, we put those structures back on slowly. We can see the tongue emerging here. Um, the uh, true vocal cords or the vocal folds. And then we just put back on the thyroid cartilage. Here's the cricoid cartilage. Okay, let's look at some other structures. Let's look at another view of some of those digestive structures once again. Um, so again, we're stripping away. Here is where we would find that parotid gland, um, right anterior to the ear. We can see the nasal cavity, the nasal coenae, the oral cavity here. We can see the gingiva, right, the upper teeth, the lower teeth, the mandible, the maxilla. As we strip away the uh, pharyngeal structures, we can see, again, these cartilages, thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, trachea, esophagus. 
Um, posterior most is going to be the vertebral column. This is the nasal mucosa or the uh, lining of the nasal cavity. Again, the hyoid bone here for reference. The uh, epiglottis, so the epiglottis, which will flap down and cover the airway here, the coanae or the opening from the nasal cavity down into the nasal pharynx, which communicates into the larynx. Here's the epiglottis posteriorly. Here's the trachea anteriorly. Here's the opening into the trachea, which is the larynx. And if we strip that away, we can see the vocal folds, right? The true vocal cords. And then a little bit upper and outer, we can see the lateral uh, false vocal cords or the vestibular folds. And can we see how narrow this opening is? So the laryngeal inlet is very narrow. So as you strip away the other muscular and connective tissue structures, this is the vocal cords. Very narrow opening. This is another group of ligaments that we did not speak about, but here's the cricoid cartilage. And then covering all of this would be the thyroid cartilage. But can we see how narrow the vocal cords are, how narrow the laryngeal inlet is? Um, this is why if someone is choking on a very small particle of food, a very small particle of food can get trapped here and prevent air from moving into the, to the airway. And so we typically do the Heimlich maneuver where we squeeze the uh, abdominal cavity. We use air that's in the lungs to kind of force that particle back up into the, uh, the oral cavity. So here's that inlet again. And as you put these structures back on, you can see that a little bit better thyroid cartilage, hyoid bone, cricoid cartilage, trachea, esophagus, etc. Lastly, let's look at some of the lung structures. We did speak about the thoracic uh, region and some of the lung structures and muscles of respiration. Um, so let's look at the lungs here. So we're stripping away fat, the sternum, etc., all of the connective tissue in this region. And we can see both uh, lungs here nicely. So the right lung on this side, the left lung on that side, superior lobe, middle lobe, inferior lobe. We can also see a small bit of the intercostal muscles as we cut away these ribs off to the side. So remember, the intercostals are gonna be studding between the ribs, the upper ribs in this region. Um, we can see the liver here, which is um, down in the abdominal cavity, um, and the diaphragm would be the dome-shaped muscle that's separating these two regions. The diaphragmatic surface, which we spoke about, the surface that rests on the diaphragm, the costal surface, which is the surface that comes in contact with the ribs, and then if we completely remove everything and look internally, we can see the mediastinal surface, which is the surface that is in contact with the bronchus and the vessels. Here's the left lung. Remember, it only has two lobes, superior lobe, inferior lobe. And you can kind of see the indentation from the ribs, right? The coastal surface, which is the surface that presses up against the ribs. We can kind of see the, the um, studded indentation on the outer surface. Here's the bronchial tree. We'll talk a lot about how the trachea then divides itself many times down to the level of alveoli. And this is what we call the bronchial tree. But for our purposes, we're only interested in the two main divisions of the trachea, which are the left primary bronchus and the right primary bronchus. The right primary bronchus is slightly shorter and wider um, because of the, uh, the, the the shifting of the thoracic region because of the heart, um, also because the right lung has more lobes, so it's a bit wider in terms of um, the diameter internally. Okay, and then lastly, let's talk about some of the muscles of respiration. So 
again, we're stripping away skin and fat and connective tissue. We've got the pectorals. We spoke about the pectorals in our last semester when we look at the upper limb muscles. We've got the sternum here, the costal cartilage, and then the ribs. And then we can see bits of the intercostal muscles running in between each of the ribs. I'm sure as we strip away the pectoralis, um, that'll become a little bit clearer. Here's the serratus anterior. So this is not intercostal. This is another muscle that also kind of stubs in between the ribs from our upper limb unit. We can see the xiphoid process here, um, the body and the manubium, structures that we should be familiar with. And then as we strip those muscles away, um, we can see parts of the diaphragm, hopefully. So remember the diaphragm is dividing the thorax from the abdominal region, and it's gonna be a dome-shaped muscle that spans um, this region, the, the lower ribs and separates that a compartment. We can see the spine, the vertebral column posteriorly. Okay. And then although they're not shown here, I want to point out where they would be. The sternocleidomastoid mastoid is going to be inserting on the sternum and the clavicle, the mastoid process, and then the other infrahyoid muscles that we spoke about will also be inserting here on the manubrium of the sternum. And then the intercostals, external intercostal, you can see there. Um, diaphragm is shown here nicely now, dividing this compartment. And then some of the strap muscles that I just mentioned, right? So sterno, um, these are gonna be the infrahyoid muscles. Some of the scalene muscles are also shown here. They are assisting with breathing as well. Clavicles coming back on. This is sternocleidomastoid. And then we're putting back on pectoralis minor, serratus anterior. This is the scapula, the clavicle. And then over top that would be pectoralis major. And although it's, again, it's not shown here, but platysma would be the most superficial muscle that kind of sits around the entire neck and inserts down here um, and eventually over onto um, the lateral aspect as well. That is the platysma. So the platysma isn't shown here, but it's the most superficial muscle of the neck.